How old is the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible? Was it written back in the Persian or Babylonian times? Russell Gamirkin, who's an independent researcher, scholar, and he's done a lot of research for a long period of time, he's come to the conclusion that the Bible may not be as old as one may suppose. Stay tuned and don't forget, check out the description. He has a few books, Barosis and Genesis, Manetho and Exodus, his second book, Plato and the Creation of the Hebrew Bible. Can you imagine if the Hebrew Bible was written during the Hellenistic period? What if it's not as old as what we thought? But Derek, what about all the Babylonian type of te text that we see in like Genesis? Or what about the Assyrian Persian type of uh, combination of things that we start to see with Zoroastrianism? How can that be written during the Hellenistic period? You're going to want to see this show. Uh, Russell Gamerican is going to be obviously coming back to entertain us again. He's talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls. He has thoughts on the New Testament. We go all over the place during this introductory show. Go show him some love. Hit like on this video. Subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to comment your thoughts down below. Thanks a lot, everybody. We are Myth Vision. For those of you who are like me and who are gripped by this book we call the Bible, which is a compilation, depending on the canon that you particularly saw favored in your denomination, your sect, whatever it may be, we were all gripped by this. And it truly had me by the soul, so to speak. And I've obviously deconstructed over a long period of time to come to the conclusions I'm at today and I'm still learning and I'm still trying to wrap my head around what is this book? Where did it come from? Who wrote it? Why did they write it? What is the nuances and the nook and crannies and the details in this thing? How do we know? Why are these things important? Well, I kind of look at it like somebody who, who beat me up, you know, traumatized me in my past. And here I am looking at this book going, I got to figure out my, the guy that had me gripped so bad and hurt me so bad in so many ways and may have caused me harm. And there were some good memories, don't get me wrong. Well, today we have somebody with a very interesting theory, Russell Gamirkin, and I hope I pronounced that better than any other host that you've had on your show. <laughs> you, you did. <laughs> well, welcome to Myth Vision Podcast, sir, and thank you for joining me. Oh, I'm, I'm honored to be here. It'll be uh, quite fun. I am going to say this up front and then I'll shut up because this is so important you get started. Uh, for anyone watching this, I'm telling you, you're going to want to watch this to the end. This is definitely one of those. You're going to want to pick up the books. You're going to want to check out the material. I've already listened to all the audio versions he has out there on YouTube, and I promise you that's the case. Um, Russell, if you don't mind, I guess let everybody know who you are. What, what is your research? What is your specialty in this field? Sure. Well, um, I'm a writer, researcher, independent scholar, which means I don't teach at a university. Uh, I don't have a PhD. Um, I just, uh, I research on my own. I'm an autodidact. Uh, I'm well published in uh, um, scholarly journals. Um, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been writing in the field for 20 years. I'm uh, pretty well respected, and I've got it totally not on uh, credentials, but just on the quality of my work. So um, I've got two books already published with uh, major uh, academic publishing houses. Uh, you might have heard of, uh, ac of Rutledge Academic Press in uh, New York and London, and uh, that's my current publisher. Um, I publish articles on the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, on a famous inscription in the Israel Museum that might be a modern forgery. Um, most recently about the historical basis of the Solomon story in the uh, Jewish Bible. But mostly I'm known as a foremost expert on Greek sources used by Old Testament authors that point to the date, location, and authorship of the books of Moses. Um, the books of Moses are, of course, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Who wrote them? You know, not Moses, obviously. But history tells us that a delegation of Jewish scholars visited Alexandria, Egypt, around 270 BC by royal invitation from a Greek king named Ptolemy Philadelphus. 
to translate these five books of Moses into Greek. It's the famous Septuagint translation that uh, some of your viewers will have heard of uh, that was housed in the Great Library of Alexandria. Well, I have argued that these 70 scholars, these Jewish scholars invited to Alexandria, were not only the translators, but also the authors of these same books of Moses, and that they drew on legal and historical research they conducted in the Great Library. Um, they wrote the original Hebrew text of the Pentateuch, or the books of Moses, and then they translated it into Greek for the same library that they did the research in. And then they went back to Jerusalem and put together the rest of the uh, Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament. Now, this is a radical theory in uh, two respects. Uh, first, that the biblical authors read and used various Greek authors, such as Homer, Hesiod, Plato, and others. And number two, that the Bible was written a lot later than most scholars thought, uh, especially here in America, where we seem to be really behind the times. And, scholarship. So um, my first book, which introduced these series, was called uh, Barosis and Genesis. And uh, here's how it came about. I was doing research in the late 1990s um, in the University of Oregon Library for another project on the historical basis of certain Greek myths. And I ran across a book with all the collected fragments of an obscure writer named Barosis who was a priest of Marduk, uh, one of the major kings and, uh, I mean, gods of Babylonia. And he wrote a history of Babylon in Greek around 280 BC, not long after the conquest of Alexander the Great. So I photocopied the whole book, which was my habit back then. And uh, when I read it, I was struck by how closely the start of his book resembled the start of Genesis. Now, scholars have known for a hundred years that the first chapters of Genesis drew on a variety of ancient cuneiform texts, like uh, the Babylonian creation story, uh, the Sumerian king list that had 10 generations of incredibly long-lived kings before the flood, uh, the Babylonian flood story uh, taken from the Epic of Gilgamesh, and so forth. But how did the biblical authors obtain all these exotic cuneiform sources, some of them written in Akkadian and some in the earlier dead language of the Sumerians. Well, as it turns out, and this was really interesting to me, Barosis translated every one of these specific texts into Greek for his book on the history of Babylonia. And his translations and paraphrases sometimes were closer to the biblical versions of these same tales than even the cuneiform originals. Mm. So, I, <laughs> so I found this stunning and, uh, and really perplexing. The Babylonian priest named Baro says, clearly he never read the Bible. But was it possible, I asked myself, that the biblical authors read Barosis? Um, but after all, you know, biblical scholarship that time was pretty and I'm uh, pretty unanimous that the books of Moses had been written like from 900 BC to four or 500 BC. This is centuries before Barosis. So if the biblical authors drew on Barosis, they would have written sometime after 280 BC, which just sounded crazy, you know, to me even. But then I heard about an article that had just come out in 1993 by a Danish scholar named Niels Peter Lemke called, Is the Old Testament a Hellenistic Book? Uh, and it asks a simple question, why do biblical scholars insist on dating the biblical text as early as possible? Why not look at the latest possible date as the proper starting point? Because that's when you know that these texts actually exist. Um, we don't know that they existed, you know, 1000 BC, but we do know that they existed 200 BC because we have, you know, copies or references or stuff. So he pointed out that the first real evidence for the Old Testament and for the books of Moses uh, comes from around 270 BC, 
when the five books of Moses were translated into Greek for the great libra library of Alexandria in Egypt, uh, 50 years after the conquest of Alexander the Great. Before that time, there are few historical references to the Jews and none at all to biblical writings, zero. Uh, but after that date, there's an explosion of uh, Bible related writing. Um, oh, for instance, there's, uh, you know, you start with the Septuagint and then you have some fragments from Qumran from about 250 BC and the astronomical book of Enoch and pseudo Eupolemus and the book of watchers and Demetrius of the chronographer and on and on and on. They're just, they're everywhere. Right after the Septuagint came out. Um, so what's the real evidence that the Bible was older than 280 or 270 BC other than just naked assumptions? Um, that was my question, and I dug a bit deeper, and I found convincing evidence that not only did Genesis draw on Barosis, who wrote around 280 BC, but Exodus drew on Manetho, who was an Egyptian priest who wrote a history of Egypt around 285 BC, <clears throat> and talked about troublemaking Egyptians being expelled into nearby Judea. Um, and I found lots of other similar evidence for other minor Greek authors that showed that the books of Moses had to have been written after 273 or 272 BC, the latest of these Greek sources, and yet before around 270 BC, when they were translated into Greek for the Great Library of Alexandria. So they were written like in Hebrew at most a year or two before they were translated into Greek, which was. Uh, you know, the evidence was pointing me somewhere. So then I asked myself, where did the authors of Genesis get all these Greek writings? Well, well, all these Greek books on history used by the biblical authors were housed where? In the Great Library of Alexandria, uh, which had the most complete collection of Greek writings in the entire world, including Barosis, Manetho, Plato, and all the rest. So the final piece of the puzzle finally dawned on me that the biblical authors wrote the books of Moses around 270 BC at Alexandria at the exact same time and place that these books were translated into Greek as part of the same literary project. Basically, the books of Moses were authored and published simultaneously in Hebrew and Greek. So I discovered when, where, and by whom the books of Moses were written. Um, so now we know who actually wrote the first books of Moses, when and where they were written, and what the favorite books were on their library bookshelves. Uh, it's almost like having a telescope into the past pointed at the very time when the first biblical writings were created. So it, th this is interesting, uh, Russell. Let me close this window real quick because I keep hearing yeah. cars pass by. Hold on. Ah. All right, that's better. <laughs> so this is very interesting uh, to give our audience something in dummy terms. I like to break it down for you who yeah. may not know this. Um, the Bible by critical scholars, by by people, you know, that you would say are taken serious, that aren't fundamentalists and have no necessary axe to grind, will say, you know, this book was maybe written 700, you know, anywhere from 900, 700. And of course, some of the books, they will say, you know, go much later. Daniel would be a late date. They agree. They agree with Russell on this and they'll say, hey, I, I agree some of these books are later, but not, you know, the totality of some of the ancient books that have Babylonian hints or Egyptian ideas that we know go way back into antiquity. Um, and I just wanted to say that what makes you dis different, I think, and this is important before we move on to a different idea, um, is you're suggesting most, if not all, are uh, were compiled at this time and written at this time, even if they were using old sources from the yes. Alexandrian Library. Okay. Yes. Now, are any of those sources... I, I ask this because this is pertinent. We could find ancient Egyptian sources. We could find ancient 
Canarium or uh, sorry, I mispronounced it. The Babylonian uh, cuneiform tablets and stuff. My question is, were there Hebrew or Israelite writings in any way, shape or form that you think, and it wasn't just oral, or do you think they actually started putting pen to paper in around 270, 280 BC, and that was the first time? Well, mostly, uh, that, that was mostly the first time. There are some older source documents. Um, for instance, in the Book of Kings, there's the annals of the kings of Judah and the annals of the kings of Israel and uh, the Acts of Solomon. Those are three uh, seemingly authentic source documents that date back to the actual kingdoms of Judah and Israel. So those are old. Those are uh, um, you know, before 586 BC when Jerusalem fell. And there's, um, among the prophets, there's one authentic collection of oracles, and that's the book of Haggai. And it uh, absolutely uh, resembles Assyrian oracle collections. Um, I haven't published on it yet, but, uh, you know, the format, the two-year time frame, everything is, so it, that's authentic. And that's around uh, what is it, 516 BC. Um, but other than that, not a whole lot. And uh, for the Pentateuch, it doesn't seem to draw on any uh, local native Jewish and Samaritan written sources. Um, and that, that is interesting. I think Elephantine is a good place to go in this, in light of the literature and why it's important what's so important about elephantine in this, in this idea, by the way, most people don't even know what it is. So you might want to tell them. <laughs> yes. Well, um, in Egypt, there was, uh, there was this fortress on the Nile that was kind of a division between Egypt proper and Ethiopia. Uh, it was this Island called elephantine and there was a military colony colony there that guarded the border and it had Jewish troops, Aramean troops and uh, a few others. And you know, this is Egypt and it's dry and parchment documents from between 450 BC and about 400 BC, they've survived to the present day. And they provide an amazing window on Jewish life, um, say down to 400 BC. So this colony at Elephantine, um, it had its own temple of Yahweh. So there wasn't just one temple at Jerusalem, there was this other temple at Elephantine. And they were, they were polytheistic. Um, they, there's no reference to any biblical writings in all those documents. Um, there's correspondence between the priests at Elephantine who, who were not from the house of Aaron, by the way, uh, they were just, we don't, who were they? Who knows? But they were in correspondence with the, um, the temple at Jerusalem and the high priest and his brothers and uh, the religious authorities in Samaria um, because there was some kind of a problem. Their temple got burned down and they wanted permission to build a new temple. And um, well, evidently the people at Jerusalem said, sure, go ahead, go for it. Even though Deuteronomy says you can only have one temple, that's it. Um, but there's no references in all of the writings of Elephantine to Moses or Abraham or David or any of the big names from the Bible. I'm mean, not only as biblical characters, but they aren't used as personal names. And they have a Sabbath, except that they work on the Sabbath. I mean, they have the seventh day of the week, but there's this one letter where this guy says, you're going to pick up this load of vegetables that we're sending by boat uh, this Saturday. And if you don't, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> so <laughs> they're, they were not very observant in terms of the Sabbath. No, they didn't have a religious Sabbath. Uh, they had a Passover, but it was purely agricultural. It wasn't the celebration of Moses and the Exodus. So anyway... There's, for decades, people have wondered, well, how can you have, um, you know, the Pentateuch and the books of Moses, and yet there's these heterodox uh, 
Jews out there worshiping Haram Bethel and a bunch of other gods and uh, Sabbath breakers and all, and how come they're in this happy relationship with Jerusalem? Uh, it was blowing their minds. Well, the reason is there there was no Bible back then. There was uh, the books of Moses hadn't been written. There's none of the biblical traditions. Uh, it, it was just it's before that. So. Um, no, there was no Bible in the Persian period. Uh, it just what didn't exist, and that's the economical explanation. And there's finally been a book or two that has acknowledged that fully. It said this, uh, you know, elephantine is not an anomaly. It's not a problem. It's just the way it was back then. They didn't have biblical. And that was, uh, you know, that was about 100 years before the time we're talking about. The Septuagint and the when I say the books of Moses were written, when all of a sudden, boom, you've got all these biblical writings that just come out of nowhere, and that's the new culture. Re Russell, this is this is fascinating information, by the way, because I've never heard anyone explain this like this. In fact, I never heard of Elephantine prior to you, which was kind of interesting. It's like, hold on, I knew about Samaria and Mount Gerizim. I didn't know right. that there was a whole nother thing going on. And you've said on previous shows, uh, which I definitely need to read your material. This was like, I had to get you on an introductory show for our audience and let them also pick up your material. It's very important that, that I, I consume that. But you mentioned something that just is very like, oof. So if you hold sacred, the old Testament, this is probably something you're going to reject immediately due to bias or, uh, just something you can't accept that northern and southern Israel, or if if I can use the term Judah and the house of Israel, uh, Samaria being the capital, if you will, um, they were never really part of the same one unified group. Just like Elephantine was never Judea, they were never the same group. They may shared things in common, like Yahweh. Uh, they, you know. I could pick up a God, Murdoch or Baal. Okay. And we have our own tradition down here, completely different possibly than the one that's in Judea or the one that's in Samaria. And so you say they're not the same people. In fact, they were separate traditions completely and never were a 12 tribe community. No, they, they weren't. There's, um, you know, there's Assyrian inscriptions, there's uh, Moabite inscriptions. We've got information back there, and there's no reference to 12 tribes of Israel or even 10 tribes of Israel. There's, uh, they know about Judah, uh, which was uh, that southern small kingdom. Um, Naphtali maybe is a little region up in Galilee. There was a tribe of Gan Gad, uh, but that was Moabite. It wasn't Israelite. It was uh, the Moabite inscription says, uh, you know, the, the people of Gad have been uh, Moabites since forever. So these tribes don't didn't exist. I mean, they're they're illusory. And um, my my latest book uh, that just came out, I don't know, three years ago, uh, it has a whole section on the twelve tribes because twelve tribes were common. Um, also 10 tribes, which, um, uh, that's how, uh, the biblical king lists either, I mean, tribe lists, they either have 10 tribes sometimes, sometimes they have 12 tribes. The names of the tribes are all different and they're in different order. But the Greeks very commonly, they divided up their nations into, uh, usually 12 tribes so that they could rotate duties from month to month to month. Um. Athens had, uh, well, for a while they had a 10 tribe system, but then, um, then around, I don't know, 325 BC, they added a couple tribes. So now they had 12 tribes at the same time as uh, these books of Moses were written. Uh, Plato said 12 tribes, that's the perfect system. You know, you should have 12 tribes. Uh, he wrote about that in Plato's Laws, uh, which had this utopian form of government and constitution that he said, uh, you know, he was advocating. Um, and he, so 12 tribes, that's a Greek idea. 
and there were lots of little colonies and places that uh, that that had six tribes or twelve tribes. Nowhere in the ancient Near East. It's uh, something they picked up from the Greeks. Okay, so I, I think this is a good question to ask. The last guy who interviewed you, Dagger Squad, <laughs> yeah. Garfield, he says, the, the dagger, you know, and he has his accent and he's talking about the dagger. Yeah, that's another dagger. Russell, if you could give us some examples of parallels, uh, if you have any off the top of your head, that just something interesting that you saw, just like the 12 tribe kind of idea that gives more of like a Hellenistic uh, spin that typical scholars don't uh, run there for that information, if that makes sense. So where there's someone who might say that looks Persian, there's no way there'd be Hellenistic thought in this Persian text, or that's Babylonian, like we talked about your first book, um, you know, that wouldn't be Hellenistic. That's so old. And uh, you mentioned Genesis as an example that there's Hellenistic. And in fact, that the Genesis one is like almost identical to something Plato put out, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's true. And I just finished, I mean, I'm talking two days ago, <laughs> I finished the final draft of my book on uh, um, Plato's Timaeus and the biblical creation accounts. Um, um, yeah, he, he had a whole book, which was one of the most popular books in, uh, in the ancient Greek and Roman world um, called Timaeus about his theories on the origin of the universe, um, cosmo cosmology or cosmogony. Uh, he said there was, he, he said that there was only one God, Derek. There was one God at the start of creation. I mean, he's the demiurge, the craftsman, the creator from this eternal realm of being who um, he decided he wanted to create a perfect image of himself, uh, namely the universe as a living being. And he, uh, he fashioned it. And uh, anyway, the account in Timaeus echoes so much in the Genesis 1 account and also um, Genesis 2 and 3 because um, Plato didn't just talk about this universal, eternal, monotheistic God, which uh, the Jews got monotheism from Plato. Uh, this seems very clear. <laughs> Greek idea. It's not Persian. It's, uh, yeah, the, the Greeks invented monotheism. It was the Greek scientists, the Greek uh, natural philosophers who posited that there was a divine intelligence who started this whole thing. Uh, and uh, so they had this monotheistic idea. Some of them got executed because uh, for their atheism because they didn't believe in all the little tiny gods running around uh, the Greek world. So if you were a monotheist, that, that they considered that atheism. They passed a law against it, and uh, you could be executed. Right. Uh, that's, what, that's what got Socrates. I that thought that I thought the um, and I, I have to cut in just to point out I thought that an ancient Egyptian uh, uh, pharaoh was you know Akhenaten I, yeah. I thought was the original but or at least yeah he no he he did he did uh, promote uh, the cult of Aton I think um, that was a little blip uh, after he died or was assassinated or whatever happened to him uh, that was over. Um, so yeah, that, that was a little idiosyncratic blurb, but it was not this philosophical, uh, eternal, cosmic, monotheistic God that some of the Greeks, including Plato, came up with. But now Plato also did something else interesting, because he didn't want to get executed for, uh, for being an atheist because he only believed in one God. Uh, so he said, well, yeah, okay, so there's this craftsman who created the universe, um, but then he had a bunch of sons and daughters, the Greek God, and they're running around on earth or wherever they're going. And uh, so, yeah, there were uh, sons of God running around, uh, and that's exactly what you see in early Genesis. 
So, so and, I, I have to mention, I, I'm sorry, I have to say this for others who are watching my audience. There are different ideas floating around that people don't, they don't interpret sons of God the same way you're, you might be describing it. And, and what I think Russell's saying here for everybody, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that these sons of God are deities, okay? These are the sons of God that are under the pan. They're like the pantheon of deities where the most yeah. supreme, according to the Bible, would have Yahweh or, or the God of Israel. Um, that's the biblical perspective, right? They put him chief above all. However, these other gods, if I'm not mistaken, in the ancient world were, call, were called Damions or like pretty much demons, if you will, is what they were, sons of God, so to speak, that had powers over particular areas and, and they're regional in some way? Um, yeah, the Greeks, they had uh, different gods over different countries. And Plato was unique because he said they all got along. They didn't have wars together. Like Homer said, you know, uh, Zeus battled against, you know, Hera and this and that, you know, and there were all sorts of cosmic battles in Greek literature. Plato wanted to censor all of that. He wanted all the gods to get along. Uh, but in the biblical, in the Bible, you have the uh, Apparently, 70 sons of God, just like in uh, the uh, Baal epic of, uh, of ancient uh, Canaanite. Um, ba Baal had 70 sons in his divine council. Well, Psalms and Deuteronomy in different places, they have a divine council too. And uh, in Deuteronomy, they say that Yahweh was one of these lesser gods who was over Israel and that every one of the gods was over a different nation. And there were, there are 70 nations in the table of nations in Genesis 10. So, you know, you've got, uh, you've got 70 gods running around and Yahweh is one of them. He was not the supreme God. He, he got promoted later, but no, he was one of those little terrestrial gods wandering around. He ruled, he ruled, the Garden of Eden, sure, and uh, like Zeus, he was Zeus was a uh, he was not the eternal monotheistic god. He was one of the lesser gods, but he was kind of in charge of the other gods. And the Bible does say that Yahweh was kind of kind of in charge, uh, but uh, kind of no, like he's, Zeus, except he hasn't slept with exactly. any women. <laughs> well, if you count Mary well, yeah. in the New Testament, it's kind of a weird impregnation type spirit thing, but. I don't know, you know. <laughs> yeah, but except uh, here's this, uh, Derek, in, in Genesis chapter 6, you have the sons of God cohabiting with these beautiful daughters of men. And they, uh, they married them, and they had children, the giants. And uh, they had lots of gods running around having marriages just like Greek gods, and just like uh, Plato had in uh, his sequel to Timaeus, which was called Critias, which had the story of Atlantis. Uh, Atlantis was ruled by uh, Poseidon. Well, actually, Poseidon kind of populated Atlantis because he married this uh, local girl that he found particularly attractive. And he had 10 sons, and uh, they were the lords of Atlantis, and so on and so forth. So yeah, the Greeks, they had these gods running around and, and having all sorts of wild uh, orgies, I guess, with uh, whoever they could get away with and uh, have an offspring that were these heroic people, you know, Hercules and all these other semi-divine humans. And all of that's in the Bible too. You know? I, have, I have to ask you a question. I was listening to a podcast recently, and this is very interesting because you didn't talk about any of this on any other show. So I'm glad that we are able to talk about this. This is important. I was listening to Christine Hayes, which she's done a great job, you know, in, in so many ways. I learned so much from her, from divine law to um, understanding, uh, you know, who the Gentiles, who the Goyim, what are the others of the nations, et cetera. And there was another um, professor. I uh, can't remember her name, but her and Christine seem to collab often in, in scholarship on these things. And she was talking about how the gods run in the blood. She was explaining how not only are they local, if you will, a god runs a territory in a land, mm -hmm. but also you listen to the Greeks and she actually said this, and I wanted, I think you're going to take a different stance, I suspect, than what she says. And this is, I've never heard expressed anywhere yet. 
but they compare the Greeks and the Greeks say, I'm a descendant of, right? Uh, Zeus or uh, whoever it may be, these you know, people are descended of their God. Israel is the firstborn sons of Yahweh. They seem to be direct, if you will, it seems like, in a strange way, descendants of their God. Um, however, these scholars said that the people of Israel are a little distinct and different in how they're descended of Yahweh. If you take what you're saying to the bank, it would seem and appear to me the same way like you just mentioned Poseidon or Zeus may populate a people, and therefore now you have the generations that come from their divine god. Uh, did Yahweh maybe play a role similar to these other Greek gods? Um. That's conceivable, and um, you know, archaeology has found a couple uh, inscriptions that talk about uh, Yahweh and his uh, and his Asherah, his wife, his consort. So back uh, back in the actual historical days of the kingdom of Judah and, and Samaria, yeah, he had a wife or or a consort, uh, and probably had sons and daughters, all of them did uh, back in ancient Canaan. Um, now, outside the Bible, you have the books of Enoch and Jubilee and things like that, and they seem to indicate that the righteous line that led down to Noah, there were lots of intermarriages between uh, the watchers and humans. Now, in the Enoch literature, the Watchers were uh, angels, but really they, they go back to the sons of God in Genesis 6. So it's kind of a um, tradition that didn't quite make it into the Bible, but made it into some uh, the pseudepigrapha and stuff that really did suggest that uh, Noah and that whole line were, were uh, descended from intermarriages with the gods. Um, Yahweh, I don't think there's a specific tradition to that effect, but, uh, but generally speaking, uh, yeah, these gods, they, they had wives and children and, uh, and there were, and clearly there, uh, Yahweh, Yahweh, uh, and in the garden of Eden, he was not the only God running around and Adam and Eve were not the only people running around. Um, Cain murders Abel and he has to wander off and he's afraid all these other people living all over the earth, they're going to kill me. And he goes off and he, uh, he marries somebody, uh, you know, it wasn't his sister. Uh, so there were lots of peoples and gods and their kingdoms all over the earth. Yeah, that's implicit in early Genesis, uh, but it's really explicit in the Greek traditions and in Plato as well. So uh, the Bible is a lot weirder and uh, less <laughs> monotheistic than people would like to imagine. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think they obviously had their God supreme um, in the narrative. Of course, Yahweh ends up being their, their uh, primary, if you will. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. And that, that comes to the dating, which is important in, in some of the ideas my, my, uh, my friends and I have wrestled with, like Stephen Nelson and stuff, were kind of like, there's an evolution, it seems, of thought, which, you know, if one's going to compile, and I don't know if this is the right question to ask right now in such an introductory uh -huh. show, but the evolution of God, as well as the evolution of someone like Satan, you know, he takes on a different role later in the narrative, it seems he changes, would one... Yes you know, they're sitting in one spot and everybody's writing this together. Um, why does the character evolve and change? Do you see what I'm saying? Or Yes, I sure do. And um, I addressed that thoroughly in my last chapter of my current book. Um, so in Genesis, the book of Genesis is very philosophical. Um, you have Plato's Timaeus, uh, his creation account that really influences uh, chapters one through three, uh, where Yahweh is clearly one of these local gods walking around and reclining in the garden. And uh, he doesn't know what's going on. He has to ask questions like any other 
uh, down there. You know, later he comes, uh, he has, uh, you know, a veal cutlet dinner with Abraham and Sarah. You know, he and his angel friend, they march across and they get invited into the tent. So anyway, he's just their little runaround God. Um, okay, where was I going on this? Uh, so, so Genesis is philosophical in the sense that in the whole book of Genesis, all these gods get along. And really, the nations pretty much get along, too. You don't have all these gods warring together. That starts with the book of Exodus. Exodus through Joshua. Uh, God is warring against the Egyptian gods. God is warring against Chemosh, the god of Moab. Uh, he's He doesn't like any other gods. He's the only god. You're going to worship him. There's no gov local governor gods. Uh, he has total authority, uh, you know, and and the one rule for Israelites is you have to worship me and only me, anyone else. Uh, you get executed. Uh, uh, everybody goes into captivity. So there was a, Genesis was very accommodating. You know, polytheism was okay. But there was another group who were not, these philosophers and because there were a lot of people writing in Alexandria and this other faction they were pro Yahweh they were highly nationalistic and they had this thing where Yahweh was the supreme god at war with all the other gods later uh, it, between the Old Testament and New Testament that really morphed into uh, God versus Satan. There were wars going on up in heaven. And uh, Plato said the whole divine realm was good. Everything divine is good. All the gods are good. They're not jealous. He says repeatedly, uh, the gods are not jealous. They have, and then the Ten Commandments says, uh, because I am a jealous God, you know, different vision, different group of authors. And those are the guys who actually, they won out in the end and the philosophers got kicked to the curb. And then you get Satan and good gods versus bad gods and all the rest of that whole. That, that makes perfect sense to why Paul, in my opinion, uh, would go to people who have different gods. And there's Yahweh again, his God, competing to try and once again have them turn away from their gods, which I guess the, the scholars that I was mentioning earlier, and I got to get them on the show at some point too, they're kind of doing exactly what you said. Gods are competing at this point. It used to be, look, you know, someone who was a God fear can come worship Yahweh and go back and worship, you know, whoever their gods were and everything was cool. Paul's running with this tradition that you're talking about here. And he's saying, you got to let these gods go. And don't worry, our God's not only going to protect you from judgment from your God, he's going to defeat your God. So yeah, this is an interesting theme. Yeah. Yeah, holy war. Uh, you know, God and his people uh, against everybody else and their gods and genocide and all the rest. Uh, not a, not a uh, good philosophical view of the world. Uh, so in my next book, Plato and the Creation of the Hebrew Bible that I kind of alluded to, um, you know, most of the book is dealing with uh, the laws of Moses and how a lot of them came right out of Plato or else out of Athenian law. Plato wrote a book called uh, called Laws, Plato's Laws, and he came up with this ideal constitution and how to create a colony and how to make it perfect so it would last through time forever. And uh, he said, okay, here's the key, according to Plato. You're going to have country that's going to last forever what you got to do and we'll never overthrow its constitution and laws what you've got to do is you got to make the people believe that the gods wrote their laws back in ancient times that they're divine and that they've never changed and then people are going to say our fathers we are so our forefathers we're so proud of them and god wrote these laws and we're never going to change them and we're going to defend this land to our last breath and uh, and we'll, we're going to be loyal because, you know, this is a, 
this is a theocracy here. God is ruling uh, our country through, uh, through the laws, the divine laws, and also Plato invented this system where the government would be, uh, it'd be run by priests and theologians. So the, the Jews and, uh, and Samaritans in 270 BC, they took over all of that. They took over the idea of these ancient divine laws uh, that Moses got from Mount Sinai. Uh, and they invented a theocracy ruled by a high priest and Sanhedrin. It all comes right out of Plato's laws. And he also uh, said what you also have to do, because people are going to know, hey, you know, uh, we just heard about these ancient divine laws uh, two weeks ago. Uh, what's with that? So he said, here's what you got to do. You have to create a national literature. Uh, it has to be only approved text. It has to to be in line with the government's theory of the past and everything else gets censored and people only read these divine sacred books and that's it. You keep out outside information, you use that in all the schools and in one generation, the memory of the past will disappear and all the younger generation will believe all this stuff. Uh, so there you have, the Hebrew Bible, which uh, there's there's no such thing as a national literature of approved text in the Greek world, in the ancient Near East, anywhere except in Plato's laws. That's where the idea of the Bible came from. And um, that's how we got these religions based on books. That, that concept that you just brought reminds me of the Exodus narrative. It reminds me in which people weren't allowed to enter to the promised land if they were a previous generation because they had bent the knee to the golden calf or, or something. That, that is interesting because that generation wasn't, I guess they were there to witness. You know, it's almost like we got to go to the next generation before we can take them into the, fl the land flowing with milk and honey. And if, if that did come from Plato, that'd be interesting. I don't know, because that's something I think that's going to be interesting when I read your book. You press hard on looking for Hellenistic tendencies. And do you do so in many places most people don't, uh, where most scholars will say, this is old, or this comes from, you know, Persian, or, you know, like you do with Genesis, are there other areas? Um, sure. I mean, systematically, uh, here's how it works from a systems theory. Um, scholarship has passed down their knowledge from generation to generation, from 0 BC or AD, clear down to the 20th century. It's one generation educating the next one. And so you revere your teachers and you accept, mo you accept most of what you've been taught. So throughout most of this period, um, the biblical texts have been dated, uh, what you would call uh, from a maximalist perspective, date them in as old as possible in line with what they claim, um, you know, unless, it, unless proven otherwise. Like Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah. Well, there's some anachronisms. Those were added a little bit later. And, uh, you know, so, so biblical scholars until the late 20th century, they dated all this stuff to, you know, the time of Solomon or the, the kingdoms or Babylonian or, or Persian era, just as early as they could get away with. Uh, and so the Greek period, the Hellenistic period, after Alexander the Great conquered the East, that was invisible to them. It wasn't even on their horizon of possibility. And so they didn't compare any of Greek literature to the biblical writings. Why would they? Because the Jews didn't know about Greek writings until after the whole Old Testament was written and their opinion. It wasn't even in, in the perspective. So. One of the uh, key things that I do is I look at my own assumptions and I look at scholarly assumptions and I identify them and uh, I try and work without them. I toss them away. So um, 
So I looked at all of Greek literature clear down to 270 BC as possible sources of influence from the Bible, because we don't know that the Bible was older than that, like the maximum must uh, believe. And so, um, so yeah, I see Greek influences all over the place. Here's one great example. Uh, the Exodus. Well, not even the Exodus, but the patriarch stories plus the Exodus. It's just a typical, stereotypical Greek foundation stories. They had foundation stories for their nations and colonies all over the place. It was their most uh, popular genre of literature. A lot of times there'd be this ancestral generation like Hercules or the Argonauts or whatever, and a god would say, hey, you and your descendants are going to inherit this land. You're going to live in this. This is a promised land. I'm promising it to you. Here's a clod of earth uh, that I think Poseidon gave to Badis, who uh, passed it from generation to generation. And eventually, um, his descendants uh, sailed in their ships from Sparta over to North Africa and founded that kingdom of Cyrene that they're ancestors had been promised by the gods. So there's two phases. There's promises to the ancestors, just like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of those. And then there's the actual generation that colonizes the land. In these foundation stories, you have God surprises this guy and says, you're going to lead my people to the promised land and establish a country. And then this person like Moses or, you know, or all these other guys, they'd say, what, who, me? No, yes, you must. And then they would take their colony, they lead it out as an army, just like the army that comes out of Exodus. The, the people who died in the wilderness, they're always described as an army. And incidentally, they had cattle and women and children, but they were an army on the move. And sometimes it would take a generation to get there through all these travails and trials. And sometimes they'd want to go home because it's hard. Uh, but eventually they'd get there to either uh, acquire or more often conquer the land. But when they get there, the, the foundation leader, at that point, he would say, all right, we're about to have a nation. So I'm going to write a constitution. I'm going to write laws. I'm going to give a big speech where I tell everybody uh, what their laws are. We're going to write it on, uh, you know, uh, on an inscription on stone. Um, I'm going to have my uh, geometers uh, go, and they're going to get allotments for all the colonists. They're going to divide up the land. They're going to divide it into tribes or territories. And then every colonist is going to have their piece of land and they're going to have it forever. All of this stuff, which uh, this is standard Greek stuff. And it's also the plot line from like Genesis 12 through the book of Joshua. And it's, it's a Greek foundation story. It's not anywhere else. Um, and there's no way that uh, the, people, the people who wrote the Bible could have heard about that until Alexander conquered the East and brought all this Greek wisdom and traditions with him. I was so, just thinking about Alexander when he led his soldiers through mountainous regions, through um, through desert regions, and even his soldiers, you know, they were willing to follow him, but they wanted to go home. So I don't know if that has a, any role, but I do think it's interesting. I, I want to look at these evidences that you're bringing. Yeah, Plato and the creation of the Hebrew Bible, I think it's chapter five, maybe, that... Uh, talks all about foundation stories and uh, um, and what's really interesting is that the Greeks uh, constitutions and laws were really essential to them because they governed themselves they were democracies they wrote their own constitution uh, they abided by their own laws they had uh, their own army and uh, they were involved they voted they held office um, so this was critical to them. Um, now, there was no such thing as a constitution in the whole ancient Near East. You don't see it from, you know, 4000 BC down to 
Alexander's conquest. Not one example, uh, but the books of Moses has lots of constitutional content and, it, and it, they could only have learned that from the Greeks. They could have only learned it after Alexander conquered. Wow. <laughs> That's actually really intense. I mean, I'm take, I got to take your word on this because I haven't actually, I'm not as well read at all. And I am going to start to read a lot of this material and check out your book and look at your sources. Cause I hear yeah. you said every sentence you wrote, you had to put a source down. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've got at least 2000 footnotes or citations. Yeah. For one I want to bring book. up some fun stuff. Uh, sure. If you don't mind if we take no. a break from the heavy stuff, because what <laughs> you said about uh, Plato is extremely important and understanding why it would be a, why they concreted this uh, national uh, idea and took it and went as far back in antiquity. And they really did do a good job of developing something like that. I mean, it's stuck with us today, right? Yeah, um, yeah. It's well written. Exactly now, as Plato predicted. <laughs> and he was right about that. I mean, yep, we'll have it forever, Derek. Sorry. Mm. There's nothing I can do. I'm working on trying to chip away at this thing, you know, and like, hey, yeah. guys, stop. Let's go this way. But uh, yeah, so, so something fun. Um, you mentioned in a previous podcast, and I asked for parallels mm -hmm. earlier. If you could think of something fun, we, I heard you mention with King David, right? King David mm -hmm. um, cuts off the giant's head, turns and shows it to the enemy and the whole nation's terrified and the Philistine run with their leg, their tails between their legs. And, you know, they're not messing with this guy. And it was one for one, you know, it was just, uh -huh. let's, let's do it. And if I fight you and win the whole nation, um, there's a parallel to a Greek myth about this. And there's something significant with the battle there that you mentioned in a previous show. You didn't go into too much detail. Can we start with something like that and you give details on that and then maybe give other examples of stories that must have come from the Hellenistic period or must have come from the Greeks that could not have come prior? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about David and Goliath. Um, David was a little, he was a slinger that, you know, the, the, the Greek armies, they had uh, a front row of people who were too poor to afford uh, a shield and a sword and stuff. So they go out there and they'd sling rocks or, uh, you know, that, they were the lowest on the totem pole or whatever in, in the Greek army. But Goliath, on the other hand, he had uh, a giant spear uh, very much like the Sarissa, which is a Greek spear. And he had the helmet and uh, he had the, the uh, breastplate. And he even had uh, someone to hold a shield for him. All of this is standard features of the uh, Greek, what they call the hoplite armies. It's, it's just standard uh, military dress uh, from, I don't know, 400 500 BC, 400, 300. Uh, it's a Greek story. Now, um, now the story itself, the battle between champions, one on each side, um, that motif appears several times in Homer's Iliad. And a lot of people have said, yeah, this Goliath story, it, it really sounds like the Iliad. Uh, but like I said, like I mentioned, the details of the battle dress are, are later than Homer's Iliad. 700 BC. This is late, but um, that's a very Greek story, and everybody knew their Homer. And this was a, uh, yeah, this was a, a great little uh, literary trope that they used. Now David himself, uh, he was he was a he was a young lad. What do we know about him? He was uh, bronze. Uh, he. Um, you know, bronze skin, very uh, good to look at. Um, he played played the lyre, was it? Lute or lyre? He was very musical. Uh, he danced in the parades. Uh, you know, after a battle uh, was won, he danced in just his loincloth, and Michelle, his, uh, his prospective wife, found that very offensive. All of that is typical of a Greek soldier in training. 
they had what they called the ephibate, which is military school. All, all Greek children, when they, I think they hit, when they hit 18, maybe 16, I'm fuzzy on that. Uh, they would go into uh, the, the secondary school, uh, they'd have gymnastics, um, they would have music, uh, which is kind of unusual uh, for a soldier, except in the Greek world where that was standard. They, um, they would, would learn how to dance because dance was very important because troops had to move in unison. So especially in parades and stuff, they would, uh, uh, they would incorporate dance in, into their, uh, so all of this, and plus um, the, uh, his physique is the Greek ideal physique for a young man, the artistic as art, art, art historians can tell you that. So here, here you have David, who is supposedly the first king of, uh, you know, Judah and Israel. He's, why, why is he like a, 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 someone in uh, the ROTC? You know, why is, why is he uh, in every way uh, acting like a young uh, soldier in training? That is very, very Greek. Um, you couldn't even fit the armor. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That they play. They did that play. They played on that pretty well. Yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, what? Uh, ask me another question, but I'll try and think of another good. Uh, think example. of another good story in time. No rush. I I wanted to go to something. This is probably going to screw you up. That's just how I am when I host. <laughs> It's always a new topic. Um, you mentioned something about Jeremiah. Jeremiah is an interesting prophet. And yeah. maybe you want to comment on that. How does that have any, what's that matter to you? What makes you different in your perspective on Jeremiah than what you hear most people discuss on him? Well, gosh, almost all students of the prophets think that Jeremiah actually lived, that he was you know, he was around at the fall of Jerusalem, that Jeremiah was, the book of Jeremiah was either written by him or written down by his scribe or, you know, old and authentic, all of this stuff. Well, um, he was, he's a literary figure. He is, uh, he conforms to a literary pattern in the Old Testament called a Deuteronomistic prophet. And here's what happened to these poor Deuteronomistic prophets. They would speak the truth. They'd tell their prophecy to a king or whatever. The false prophets would uh, all be mad at them. The king would punish them. Uh, they were in danger of their lives. They weren't heard. Um, and uh, it always turned out badly. Um, so, and they were, these Deuteronomist prophets, they were anti-establishment. Uh, well, prophecy in that time, um, prophets in, in Assyria, Babylonia, and even in Judea, based on the evidence of the book of Haggai, they were associated with the temple. They were like bureaucrats. Uh, you'd go to the temple, you'd ask a question, the prophet would say, the God says thus and such. God says, yes, rebuild the temple and bring lots of donations. Um, so they, were, they weren't anti-establishment. They didn't criticize the kings, none of that stuff. That is, uh, and, and scholars don't know really where that came from. Well, you know, I do because that's all over Greek literature. You, you look in the plays of Euripides and Aeschylus and all, you have, uh, what is his name? Uh, Timelicus, but uh, anyway, there's, there's these kings and they'd have to go up to King Creon and say, God disapproves of what you're doing and you're going to have lots of problems. And, and King Creon would get mad at them and maybe throw them in jail and they'd be in fear of their lives. And all of that stuff was just happening over and over and over again in these Greek plays. Um, and also uh, the figure of Socrates, he was a prophet. He was a martyr. He was the first martyr. He was a righteous man who uh, was innocent and, uh, and died for it. But he was also a prophet. He had what uh, he called a daemon. 
uh, a genius, a little spirit, a uh, voice that talked to him inside his head. He might have been schizophrenic, it's quite possible. But at any rate, he, he had this voice that told him what to do. And uh, he said it came from Apollo, but uh, the normal Athenians, they, they weren't having it. They didn't like him because he criticized everybody. He criticized everybody that he met. He asked them embarrassing questions and humiliated them in public. So he had lots of people who were mad at him. Uh, and he said, I have to, I'm on a mission from God. And I know you're mad at me, but I get to save the city of, of Athens. So he stuck it out. He did his deed. He got arrested for atheism and for, and not only for atheism, but for have, for introducing new gods. It's a little contradiction, but he said he had this little voice, this daemon, this genius, uh, you know, daemon comes, goes into demon, like you mentioned a little spirit, but a good one. Uh, and they said, that's a new God. We don't allow that sort of stuff. And so he had to, he, he had to drink hemlock and died. And uh, uh, yeah, he could have had the opportunity to flee, but he said, I'm a good Athenian. I'm not gonna leave my nation under any circumstances. I'll drink it. And um, from, what I, from what I understand, when they send people off like that, what they're actually saying is go worship other gods a lot of times too. When you, when you get, when you get excommunicated from the land, cause your God a lot of times is very, <clears throat> most of the time from what I understand is your God is the God of that land. Yes. So by, by saying you need to leave the land is you need to get away from our God. You know, you're, you're going to have to go to a different God. And it was kind of a disrespect thing as well on, on a whole different level than what we would understand today. Yeah, the whole exile thing. Yeah, yeah. they. Um, the only good thing about it is a lot of the Greeks in different nations they kind of worship the same Greek god, so it wasn't as severe as in the ancient Near East where Yahweh was only in Samaria and Judah. That was it. Um, but uh, yeah, they over there. If you if you went into voluntary self exile, you could escape a death sentence. They'd let you do that. They'd let you do that as late as between the first speech of the trial and the second speech of the trial. So if it was going bad against you, you could see that. Well, they'd let you do it. Uh, interesting system. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yes, so, uh, so Jeremiah, he was one of those persecuted prophets too. And uh, a lot of the, uh, his description uh, resembles some of the earlier Greek prophets in uh, in Greek tragedies, but uh, a lot of it also resembles Socrates. So you have influence specifically from Plato, from Plato's portrait of Socrates, um, who is the hero in most of Plato's writings. Uh, so my unique take on Jeremiah is uh, it's, it was very late. Uh, it has Greek influences. Uh, no, it was written in the Hellenistic period. Uh, you, you do something with, with Jeremiah and Deuteronomy um, that I thought was interesting. Deuteronomy's late, according to you. And, yes. and that's very different than what a lot of people will suggest. And they do, of course, say it comes a little later. They just don't say it comes as late as you would suspect. And I guess something that's pertinent to me at this moment, I, I carry conversation with very good friends of mine. We don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but that's what makes us such that's good okay. friends, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Deuteronomy yeah, 30. Oh, go ahead, please, please. Well, listen, I just want to say, you can learn the most from people that you disagree with. Right. That's what I've found. I always seek out opinions from people that uh, I don't fully agree with because I figure maybe it's because they know something I don't. Maybe. So, you know, you pick their brains, you might learn something, you might learn that they're full of it, or you might learn an extra fact that makes uh, you uh, a little, little wiser. So, but go ahead. Yeah, no, I've learned a lot from these people and other people, of course, and bringing people on the show that I don't know and may not agree with. I learned something, though, from each person. And um, they connect Deuteronomy 32 to the New Testament, Israel's last days. But there are people out there that suggest that Israel's last days concept of Deuteronomy 32 may take a 
a role in the narrative of the Hebrew scriptures. So you know how the New Testament likes to reuse stuff that seems to yeah. imply its first its first use is in the Old Testament. For example, uh, you shall call him Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, the, this narrative is about a person then. Jesus harps on this, or the New Testament authors harp on this thing that already had its context utilized in a, in a time in the Old Testament or during the Hebrew Scripture time. Now, in Deuteronomy 32, it talks about Israel's last days. Do you have an opinion on Israel's last days? Because it appears the New Testament is reusing this, but there's the idea where we talked about earlier how the northern and southern tribes, you have the lost tribes, the ten northern, and then Judea and uh, Benjamin and the southern tribes. And of course, some of the northern goes down into the southern according to this, and it doubles in size. And anyway, there's this idea that, well, God divorces Samaria, or if you will, the northern tribes, and uh, keeps his marriage to the southern because they're the, which tells you they're writing from a, the, the, the Old Testament's writing from a Judean perspective. But um, do you have any, any opinion on the Deuteronomy 32, Israel's last days in the context of the Hebrew scriptures? Well, let me talk to you about this whole Samaria versus Judah thing. Please. Uh, you're right. Uh, kings, most of the prophets, it's all written from the perspective of Judah and Jerusalem. The Pentateuch, the books of Moses, not so much. Why did they even have 12 tribes? Uh, most of that stuff in the Pentateuch comes from the Sumerians, or rather Samaritans. Uh, Judah plays a very minor role. And in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy mentions Mount Gerizim, which we know uh, that was the location of the Samaritan temple, mentions Mount Ebal, and uh, what was the other one? Anyway. These two mountains, that, those were holy sites for the Samaritans. Um, that continues on into John. So the, the, the implication appears to be that the place where God was going to place his name, that was Mount Gerizim. It wasn't Jerusalem. Um, so you have the five books of Moses. Um, You're going to be in trouble now. You know that, right? <laughs> oh, sure. I'm always in trouble. I, <laughs> Please continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, so when they went to Alexandria, this delegation of 70 scholars, that's where the name Septuagint comes from. It's the Greek word for 70. And the tradition was that the Jews and Samaritans sent 70, actually 72 elders, um, to Alexandria to translate the books of Moses into Greek. Um, six from each one of the 12 tribes, which uh, kind of interesting because uh, 10 of the tribes were supposed to be lost at that point, and yet here they are in this story. So um, so the, the Samaritans and Judeans, they were all together at Alexandria collaborating on the books of Moses. Uh, we know that not only from that tradition, but the Samaritans, they accepted the five books of Moses. They didn't accept any of the rest of the Jewish Bible. Uh, the Jews, uh, they had the books of Moses and everything after that. Well, here's how that happened. Originally, they were all friends for however long they were at Alexandria together collaborating. And in the prophecies of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, they were all supposed to, if they disobeyed God someday, some future generation, they would all go into exile, scattered among the nations. Then they would repent and they would all come back to the land and God would, you know, bring them back in his arms or whatever metaphor. And so, and, and, you know, it'd be great again. They'd be a restored uh, original 12 tribes of Israel. So you get some of that in the book of Jeremiah, by the way, because parts of Jeremiah says, uh, yeah, Israel and Judea, they'll, they'll all come back. And uh, 
uh, you know, they all went into exile, but they'll all come back and they'll uh, be under uh, God again. And in other parts, like, uh, yeah, no, the Jews will come back, not so much Samaria. And uh, really starting in books of Samuel onward, it's all pro uh, Judea, pro Jerusalem, Yahweh's temple in Jerusalem, the Davidic kingdom. And the Samaria was bad, evil, Baal worshippers, bad guys. God punishes them. Every king of theirs was wicked because of their high places. All the early kings of Judah had high places, but they were good. That's okay. Uh, they got rid of some of them. So anyway, uh, so it's this very, so, so you have the books of Moses written by everybody at Alexandria. Then they go home to Jerusalem and the Samaritans get kicked to the curb and the people from Jerusalem, they keep writing and writing and writing this whole national literature like Plato wanted, but it's all, uh, all Jerusalem and Judah and all of a sudden the uh, Samaritans have disappeared and that's where you get the 10 tribes, the 10 lost tribes. They weren't lost until the Jews got mad at him in the Hellenistic era because uh, the Jews wanted a monopoly on Yahweh worship. They didn't want the temple at Mount Gerizim. And so they started promoting this thing where uh, the Samaritans, they, this northern tribes, they went away and they, ne they never came back. Uh, so, so it's safe to say that they weren't necessarily lost because of the Assyrian captivity. No. And even though there may have been people there, Samaritans that were that were dispersed, there was still a there was a noticeable group of people that were probably still remaining. Or do you think that that's somewhat fictional? The whole the whole uh, uh, Assyrian. Uh, yeah, where they take everybody and deport everybody away. No, right. they, the Assyrians, they, only, uh, they would only take the ruling class and send them into exile. Ordinary people, they wanted them to stay there because they had to have somebody work the farms and produce the income. It was just a ruling class that got deported and, uh, and replaced with a new ruling class from somewhere else in, in the kingdom. Like okay. uh, a lot of Babylonians came into Samaria. And they became the new ruling class. So do you but see the anything? lower, the regular oh, people, regular Yahweh worshiping uh, country people? Uh, they were there, and there's archaeological continuity. Same people. They they never went into exile, and uh, hmm. not not. There was more of a destruction layer in Judea, but uh, still, though, there was continuity there too. There was this total exile thing. That's that's a fiction, and it's everybody recognizes that. Now. The same way Exodus from Egypt in the manner it's described is so over, I mean, exaggerated. If there was anything like that, it's so exaggerated. There's no, there's nothing like that as described. Um, what do you take on Deuteronomy 32? Do you have a take on it? The whole idea of the end of Israel's, you know, apostate Israel and stop following my ways. Do you think it, they, it plays a role during some time in Jeremiah and in the writing of this is trying to hint at something with Israel as in the Northern tribes is from a Judea perspective, or are you suggesting, what do you, what do you think is going on with Deuteronomy 32? If you don't mind. Um, gosh, I've been looking around for my Bible. For some <laughs> reason I have it misplaced. Uh, I, can, I, I, I actually do have a Bible because I am a historian so I have need for it on uh, on occasion. I've uh, got mine back here behind the screen screen if I need to grab it, but it's King James. Me too, <laughs> yeah. Because I was given to me back in 1972, I don't know, and uh, I never wanted to spend money on a new one. So I just right. stick with this. And they had great covers, very sturdy. So anyway, um, no, due to the prophecy in Deuteronomy that was aimed at all 12 tribes uh, and first the northern kingdom fell and allegedly they were all deported and then later Jerusalem fell and allegedly they were all deported and so uh, it was supposed to be a phase for both for both Israel and Judah I mean for the 12 tribes of Israel 
because uh, that was that was the Mosaic Nation, um, and they were all supposed to come back to the land. So there was uh, there was no end of Israel per se. Yeah, uh, there's the ten tribe, ten lost tribes of Israel. That's certainly not in the books of Moses, but uh, it kind of gets perpetrated starting in Second Kings seventeen, where Israel gets deported and uh, and apparently is never replaced, except for one priest who comes back to tell the Babylonians about Yahweh worship. <laughs> well, that's funny because the the Babylonian uh, Abraham. Why would yes. someone? This is a good topic, you know, rabbit trailing a little. But why would you have a guy from Babylon supposedly? Ur of Chaldees or whatever. Uh -huh. Yeah. W what's going on here, Russell? Help me understand, my friend. <laughs> uh, well, I have a feeling you know a little bit about what I'm going to answer, but it's very interesting. And this is one of my uh, innovations as a scholar. Um, there's a lot of Babylonian and Assyrian stuff in the Bible. There's the calendar. Uh, there's a few scattered laws of Moses that come from Hammurabi and Middle Assyrian law and Old Assyrian law, this and that. Um, there's traces here and there, including, uh, you know, the start of Genesis that has a lot of Babylonian traditions and including this thing where uh, all the Abraham and all of those people, they came from Babylon. Well, no. The Jews and Israelites, they were all uh, earth-born, uh, you know, autochthonous peoples who have, had lived there forever. That's what archaeology forms it. There was no invasion. They didn't come from anywhere. They certainly didn't come from uh, Babylonia. But guess what? The Babylonians came from Babylonia. Uh, when when the northern kingdom of Samaria fell in 722 BC, um, King Sargon and Shalmaneser, one or the other or both, they, uh, they brought in a replacement for the ruling class. There were some Babylonian rebels. And so when they were defeated, they took their ruling class and brought them into Samaria. And the Samaritan, uh, Samarian ruling class, they get exported. By the way, Assyria keeps on referring to Samaria, uh, Samarian charioteers. They didn't disappear. They, uh, they were still very effective uh, horsemen and used in the Assyrian army. So, uh, but so here you have these Babylonians and Assyrians who are the ruling class in Samaria. Well, what happened to them? They didn't just evaporate and become Yahweh worshiping, worshiping uh, Samaritans. Um, Every country, you get a ruling class or you get an educated class, they hold on to their heritage forever, like a dog keeps a hold of a bone. Uh, they're very possessive. You know, nowadays you've got exiled uh, any country where the, you know, where the Shah got deposed or whoever, you know, they, they try and maintain their position and status forever. Same with these people in uh, Babylon, these Babylonians that were transported to Samaritan. They kept their traditions alive. And um, a lot of stuff, uh, and they, they eventually blended in with the local uh, Israelite population. But they were the educated ones. And uh, they were there at Alexandria. They were a lot of these educated Samaritan scholars that helped write the Pentateuch. And sure, they remembered, yeah, we came from Babylon. That's where we came from. And I, we're going to write that right into Genesis because that's where we remember our ancestors came from. A um, lot of other stuff. Uh, something that uh, hasn't appeared in any of my books yet. It's like in a book, this couple books down the road. Um, the Sabbath. Where did that come from? Okay, so scholars, they know that the Sabbath is every seven days um, activity was forbidden and that that came from uh, Babylonia and Assyria. Um, 
there was uh, they had charts of lucky and unlucky lucky days. And um, first, uh, the early versions, every day of the month, you know, which was like a, a lunar month of 30 days. Every day was different as to what was lucky and unlucky. Eventually, they simplified it and they got down to a seven day cycle. And every seventh day was unlucky. And uh, you weren't supposed to do stuff, especially the king. It was very unlucky for the king to do anything that seventh day. Uh, and eventually, you know, scholars know that, uh, okay, that somehow, somehow magically that turned into over in Judea and Samaria, that turned into the Sabbath. Uh, well, how did that, but, well, it's because you had um, Babylonian scholars living in Samaria who are still doing all this calendar stuff. And uh, they used that simplified uh, system and it came up with a seven day week with the seventh day being unlucky, the Sabbath. Came from the Babylonians living in Samaria. Um, and in fact, there was a document in 163 BC when uh, Antiochus Epiphanes had uh, overthrown the Jewish temple and this and that. And the Samaritans wrote a letter to uh, the Greeks saying, <clears throat> we're good people, we don't mind you guys like the people in Jerusalem and uh, yeah, and we invented the Sabbath. That's the only claim in ancient literature as to who specifically invented the Sabbath. It was the Samaritans. Uh, it, when we talk about the Jewish Sabbath, maybe we should be talking about the Samaritan Sabbath instead. But it came. And when you say Samaritan, I need to let like some people know yeah. this is Israel. This is the this is Israel. northern Israel, right? Yes, uh, Samaria was their capital city. Sometimes in the Syrian records, they would call the whole country Samaria, or some once they called it Israel. Mostly, they called it the House of Omri. Uh, but then the Assyrians, when they conquered it and turned it into part of Assyria, it was a province of Samarina. And then when it got into the Babylonian and Persian times, that turned into uh, the residents weren't called Sumerians anymore. They were called Samaritans. But it basically means the same thing. So those are the northern people. And they worshipped uh, at their own temple, much bigger than that one in Jerusalem. Uh, the one on Mount Gerizim. So, yeah, so those Babylonians, <laughs> they were still doing stuff uh, clear into the Hellenistic era. That That's fascinating. Total t two different traditions. Um, you know, looking at it from this kind of perspective makes me really want to know more about the history behind this. Um, one of the things I figure I'd ask is because um, well, a buddy of mine asked, and I wanted to ask you, if you don't mind, these are not too big. I wanted to start off with like a show that's not too complicated so people can wrap <laughs> their heads around. But um, here's this question. How do most Hebrew Bible scholars and source critics view the documentary hypothesis? And how does your theory address this? From If there's a way to answer that without over <laughs> too much. Uh, okay, I, I won't give too much detail. Uh, the documentary hypothesis said there were four sources behind the books of Moses. There was one source that used Yahweh as the name of the God a lot. Another one used Elohim. Uh, there was a Deuteronomist. And there was the E source that also used Elohim. But anyway, they detected them as different voices. They all had their different agendas. Four different sources. Documentary hypothesis says that like J wrote around 900 BC and then E 800 and Deuteronomy 614 BC and the priestly that was in the Babylonian period, all separated by centuries as the Pentateuch or the books of Moses were evolving. Uh, well, listen, I agree that there are distinct voices, but there's not a scrap of evidence that said that they're separated by centuries. Uh, that's, extraneous. Um, in, my, in my understanding, these were just different groups of authors present at Alexandria in 270 BC. 
there were different factions and groups and they all had their own voices and that's uh my adaptation of the documentary hypothesis Do i don't you throw think that they have different voices and they separate them by centuries because well they're looking internally right and they're going well that looks like it's very uh, assyrian oh that looks very persian or that looks very babylonian or whatever and therefore because it looks like that internally therefore it must possibly be dated around the time in which the story kind of claims in a sense that these things are happening and you're saying hey the sources are in Alexandria. They could have easily developed the narrative from these sources in Alexandria. Yeah. Um, well, first off, there's so many problems with the documentary hypothesis because in some places, E uses J. In other places, J uses E. In other places, you divide it into two different sources. It doesn't make any sense anymore, like the Joseph story. If you divide it, Neither of the two stories make any sense at all. So you had J authors and E authors. They were together in the same room and they were writing it together. Uh, same thing with J and P. So it, it makes everything work if they're all talking to each other at the same time. Uh, but no, traditionally what they said is, oh, J has all these stories, you know, God's walking around and he sees Abraham, blah, blah, blah. And these are these folksy stories. That's really primitive. That's way back in Solomon's time. Maybe. And E is um, it's a little bit more advanced theologically or whatever. Deuteronomy, uh, that's different because there's only, uh, instead of in J and E, where there's different altars all over uh, Judea and Israel, Deuteronomy says there's only one temple in Jerusalem. So that must be, that must be a later development. And the priestly source, why it's all legalistic and it's cultic and it's that uh, Jewish legalism. This is a Christian perspective. So while well, that's kind of devolving, it must be last and it must be the worst. And so all of these preconceptions about primitive versus advanced and legal versus folklore, it all went into this uh, imaginary development of uh, religion in those lands as though everybody changes all at the same time you know uh it's like everybody once upon a time were telling stories and then they all decided no we're all going to be about the laws this year uh society isn't like that there's always diverse voices and just because there's two voices you can't say one's earlier and one's later that, that no longer makes any sense and people no longer really believe in the documentary hypothesis in that way. But I've, sal I was, I've rehabilitated it though, because those they are distinct voices, but if they're all talking at the same time, that really explains the whole thing. And you're sticking with what we can know with certainty, at least based, not certainty, pr high probability because of hard evidence rather than you know, speculation based on, you know, some type of assumptions that, you know, are going on. Like if, if I were to try and let's say use internal evidence, I could easily run with, well, Genesis goes way back because look at all the Babylonian stuff. But if you knew possibly what's going on in the, in Alexandria or even in your first book, the two authors that are being used possibly by the New Testament or not New Testament, sorry, Hebrew scripture uh, authors are using these possible Babylonian and Persian authors. Uh, it's easy to see how they could create and develop something in ancient plus using Plato's concepts. So I, I can see where you come from. I definitely need to read your book because once I do, we're going to definitely have to jump on a show. Um, do you mind me asking more? Go right ahead. How does your theory address the idea of Persian influence in the Hebrew Bible that supposedly crept into the tradition at a later date? For instance, the development of traditions about the role of Satan as a cosmic, cosmic antagonist and the development of apocalyptic literature. Well, yeah, that's, there's, some, there's some truth to that. Um, the Zoroastrians or the, you know, of uh, Persian times. They had uh, Ahura Mazda was their um, 
they used to say he was a monotheistic god, but really he had a flip side that was kind of darkness and evil. So there there were lots of gods going on in the Persian era. But you did, you had a dichotomy of good versus evil, uh, light versus darkness, and the two sides at war. And uh, it's been pretty well studied that that has crept into uh, uh, Jewish apocalyptic literature. Uh, light versus darkness, good versus evil, God versus Satan. Um, one of my earliest, uh, actually my earliest Dead Sea Scroll that I wrote about, and kind of got famous about in, in those circles, was my text was uh, a document called The War of the Sons of Light Against the Sons of Darkness. And um, I was able to show that uh, it wasn't as late as people said. It's actually a document. Uh, a, from the Maccabean Wars, that it was the official war manual of Judas Maccabee. But they saw themselves as the sons of light, and the enemy were Belial and Satan and the sons of darkness, and it was very much good versus evil. And somehow that did come from, uh, from Persian Zoro, Zoroastrian, but it kind of bypassed uh, the the Hebrew Bible. It, it comes out in um, the book of Daniel, which is pretty late. It's 163 BC. Well, during the Maccabean War, really contemporary with the War of the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness. Um, right. <laughs> but it you don't really see that in, uh, in the prophets or uh, pretty much anywhere else. You have Satan in the book of Job, but he's just, he's one of the sons of God. And, and I was uh, going to say, Isaiah has God, or it appears, has God as the creator, or almost like not just the creator, but it, it doesn't it doesn't sound dualistic like Zoroastrianism, because in Isaiah, right. he says, I create light and darkness. I'm in charge of both. So don't get this idea that, you know, that there's like an enemy that holds darkness in his hands that I have no, no, I'm the one who's doing both, which is actually kind of when I was Calvinist. Oh, you can uh -huh. only imagine how I used to use that as a weapon towards oh, free yeah. wills. I would tell the guys who believe in free will and believe that, well, God created Adam in the garden, and, and he wanted them to have the chance. And they slipped up almost, you know, he knew what was going to happen, but no, 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 no. I went all the way and said, look, God put him in the garden so he could fall. Like, this is how far <laughs> as a Calvinist I went. I was like, he put him there so he could fail so that he could send his son, you know, like I had a predestined right. concept. His whole purpose was he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That was the intention. He needed to fall so that his son could redeem humanity, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, so yeah, that sounds interesting because it does seem like a later development. It is a later development, but how did they get it? You know, and that's an interesting question to ask is like, when did Zoroastrianism influence, and of course, Parsi or Pharisees, uh, may come from a Persian type of influence that's taking place. But when did that happen? You know, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I, I wish I had a great answer. I know that, the, um, that Theophrastus and other Greek writers, they knew about Zoroaster, and they knew about uh, some of the uh, Persian traditions that were written down centuries later and yet uh, in, in, in their scriptures that we now have. But Theophrastus, who was a student of Aristotle, uh, he described some of those beliefs. So anyway, it was known there were these ideas floating around, uh, but the exact mechanism whereby the Jews acquired some of these ideas is a little unknown. Um, but apocalypticism is uh, is very prominent in crisis times, uh, and so during the Maccabean War, when uh, the Seleucid king uh, overthrew the temple, outlawed the Jewish religion, burned all the scriptures, and uh, made people sacrifice swine, and all of that horrible, terrible stuff, that was as crisis as you could get. That's also when you get this full-on uh, light versus darkness uh, ideology that 
really gripped uh, the, the Jewish nation and, and their literature from that point on. Where and that's they, when they really thought the end was going to happen. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. How many times do they got to do this? You know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But uh, in summer of 163 BC, they were like saying, we're going to have Michael and, and, our, and his angels are going to be on our side and we're going to defeat the uh, Belial and the forces of uh, the Seleucids that are about to come in and try and conquer the kingdom again. And uh, it's going to be apocalyptic and they're all going to be destroyed. And uh, then there's going to be a resurrection and it'll happen. Uh, you know, um, you can date it, Derek, from the time the sacrifices stopped, 100, uh, 1,260 days or maybe 1,290 days, because they keep on jumping forward a little bit. That's when this amazing victory is going to happen. And you're going to, all, all the soldiers that are fighting now, that are falling heroically, they'll be resurrected. No problem. Because uh, it's the end of the world. And we're going to have the Messiah back in no time. Now you got me. I got to ask you. You know not to bring up uh, eschatology. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> my bad. No, you you did it. You did it. It's your fault. So I'm going to blame you, and okay. it's not my fault. Um, I'll take it. Since I'm not a Christian, I can't blame it on Satan. I'm just going to blame it on you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. But seriously, I got to ask you something. You, you brought up something interesting. Is this uh, David or no, sorry? Daniel's writing in a time that obviously is late. There's this idea that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Carbon dating, I've heard the disp disputes and arguments. People like Robert Eisenman, who Professor Eisenman takes it and says, listen, internal evidence makes me suggest this is going on during the first century. And I get why. Even if it wasn't, I can get why. Because it's like another one of those. We're in a bad spot, and they're speaking very similar language, as you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as you see in Daniel. But I wanted to ask you a more to the point question. The 70 weeks, all these things that are going on. Daniel's predicting something. Christians like to go, hey, this is predicting the time of Christ, right? They have a reinterpretation of Daniel. Right, right. Was there an original interpretation of Daniel that was supposed to take place right around that time? Yeah, it was supposed to. Have, the 70 weeks were supposed to come to an end in 163 BC. The uh, the Messiah that was cut off in uh, I forget Daniel nine that was Onias the second the the high priest that was uh, executed in one seventy B C and uh, um, a few months later um, the uh, Seleucids came in and they conquered Judea and they were really oppressive and then. In uh, 166 BC, three and a half years later, uh, is when they stopped the sacrifices in the temple. Uh, and all of this was supposed to happen in the 70th week of those 70 weeks. This is number 70, and we're halfway through that last week. And then there's going to be another half a week. And at the end of that, that's when... The resurrection happens. That's when Michael will defeat all the enemies. Uh, and uh, so 163 BC, that's the end of the 70 weeks, except it didn't happen. So then, you know, a little while later, they said, well, now is the end of the 70 weeks. And now- We didn't mean literally 70 weeks. We meant 70 weeks of years and the years calculate, oh, look, Jesus yeah. came and- <laughs> Well, one good thing was they, they, their chronology was really bad back then. They really hadn't worked out how, many, how long it was between the fall of Jerusalem and the present day. It was floating. So you could always adjust the starting point to come out to 70 weeks is uh, this weekend. That's, that's when it is. Uh, and that happened over and over again. And in the Olivet Prophecy and in the uh, Book of Revelation that are all influenced by, by uh, Daniel a lot. So, and uh, they're still doing it today. They are. They are. This is, uh, this is fascinating. You, 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 it was your fault. So yeah. 
Everybody it's, heard it. <laughs> Derek, Derek, it's the Groundhog Apocalypse. <sighs> Man, and we're going to have more shows down the road where we get to talk about your understanding of Revelation, which is, you know, going to be groundbreaking information, in my opinion, because that's such a misunderstood book in so many ways. And, you know, is it a late date, like 96 AD? Is it really a during the battle date? Or is it a pre-70 AD, as some people like to, well, there's internal evidence and stuff. We'll get there. So yeah. we'll have to leave that topic for another time because if not, you know, someone's going to comment and say, Dag Nabbit, Derek, we knew you wanted to bring up full preterism. And, and uh, <laughs> I have a tendency of talking about things that had a grip on me. But uh, there, there's a very clever movement out there that does a very interesting thing with these things. And uh, me and you had a small talk on the phone. But, they, you know, in, they harmonize. They harmonize yeah. the hell out of some of this stuff and they make it make sense. And yeah. I don't think it was meant, all these books were meant, even the New Testament books, I don't think they were all meant to uh, connect the way they do, but you can look for things, you know. Yeah. I think that also works in Carl Jung's philosophy, you know, the synchronicities. If you're looking for it, mm, you'll probably find it, even if it never was intended, if that makes yes. sense. Well, so, you can take you can take any set of beliefs and you can harmonize it with any information there's always a way to connect it up uh, that's why the mormons exist that's why the jehovah's witness that's why almost every cult can come up and have a solid case in their mind yep and uh, they're they're convinced they're absolutely convinced and so i decided to be a little scientific and say let's get critical so, Russell, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to move on to another question. <laughs> There's oh, not too many. Okay. Um, okay. I have to ask these for my buddy. If I don't, um, Stephen uh, Nelson, who has – he has the gifts of the spirit on the other end, the no-no side. So he can probably curse me at will, and I don't want him to curse me. Like, I want this guy to find a way to give me blessings. So I'm asking these questions because he's a really good friend of mine, and he's interested in research and stuff far br brighter than me on these things. And um, – Here's another one. Were there any Hebrew literary and historical traditions prior to the Hellenistic period? I think we kind of touched that early. Um, did the Jews have any oral traditions or written poetry during the Persian period, which may have influenced the Bible? So in other words, for those who are watching, were there writings of these people from these nations prior uh, during periods in which the documentary hypothesis like to say J goes all the way back to the uh, Persian or to Babylonian or whatever, you know, well, nobody goes back to, to ancient, ancient, uh, beyond that. But nonetheless, uh, is there any writings that they had and they drew off of when they compiled these things during the time in the Hellenistic period that you're suggesting? Um, well, I'll tell you what, um, religious traditions are highly conservative. So, um, the religious holidays, cultic practices, all of that stuff in the books of Moses, that was a lot older than the Hellenistic era. Probably mostly oral. Uh, but we know that, uh, that they reflected earlier times because for instance, the list of sacrificial animals in Leviticus corresponds to the bones that we find uh, from Mount Gerizim uh, they had uh, a bone dump on the backside of the temple, and you get those same animals. Uh, so we know that that, that that corresponds, that goes back. Um, and along those same lines, um, a lot of this, there's, there's two clusters of psalms. Some of the psalms reference the Exodus and things in Genesis and uh, the books of Moses, and you know they they they're clearly after they were written after the books of Moses were written. There's other psalms, not so much. They just don't refer to anything uh, out of the books of Moses, and they could well be older. Their 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 religious hymns, uh, probably sung in uh, a temple or some cultic situation. They could have been written. They could have been older. Uh, I have no problem with that. In fact, in one case, I know for sure that it was older because there is one psalm, I forget which number it is, 
uh, but it corresponds to a psalm on a papyrus they found in Egypt, except that the gods in that psalm weren't Yahweh, they were like Baal and a couple other gods. And uh, so that psalm goes back to a time when, uh, you know, Yahweh and Baal and El, and there were all sorts of gods running around. That's a good early one. In fact, I've been able to date that one. Um, it's Yahwistic, but it also uh, mentions Baal and some other gods. It actually goes back to a community of Yahweh worshipers in Hamath, which is north of the Northern Kingdom. It's like, uh, and and there are some Assyrian, <laughs> there are some Assyrian inscriptions that talk about these kings with these Yahwistic names. And there's uh, some literature that actually uh, comes from around 720 BC, where these guys way up north, they're worshiping Yahweh. And they had this psalm about Yahweh and Baal and their father El and battles and and so that, not even Israelite, not Jewish, not Israelite, something weirdly bizarre uh, for a Bible person to even conceive, uh, it made it into the biblical psalm. So that's that's a good old one. I, I'm I am delighted when I can find an old source. That's what I like about you. I have to admit, as much as someone who's listening to this is going to be really like hesitant, especially if they are huge followers of people who espouse the documentary hypothesis and stuff, you're open-minded to looking for old stuff, but you're going to start with a critical stance, on per a minimalist stance based on the evidence that we do have, and then work back versus starting with something far maximus yeah. or even middle ground you're not trying to just yeah. let me start with a balanced view no you're going to go hard evidence or as much as we have in terms of you know there's documentation that supports the idea this is definitely hellenistic period when they when they uh, translate the the septuagint i have no reason or anything prior to that to suggest that they had a compilation or some type of code uh, uh, books that are compiled together we call the hebrew bible uh, prior to the time of this translation. Now, what do you think about the idea that the king that's asking them to come and translate their scripture, um, obviously you talked about the 12 tribes part being fiction in that narrative itself, but mm -hmm. would it not suppose or imply that, hey, they're having them translate something because they had a text? And yeah. that, 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 so my question is, it, to make it <laughs> dumbing down for, for my audience and myself, when they were supposed to come translate into the, into the Greek, the 70 right. elders, as the story goes, whoever asked them to come translate, are they not asking them because they already have a text? Or is that not implied in the narrative? Well, yeah, absolutely. They had a text. Um, the only thing is it wasn't a Jewish text. Uh, it wasn't a Sumerian text. It was a Greek text. Uh, it's a very interesting story. Okay, so this is Ptolemy II Philadelphus. He's the second king uh, in the Ptolemaic Empire. When Alexander the Great uh, conquered most of the world and then he died, it got split up among his four generals. One of the generals was Ptolemy I and he took Egypt as his own little kingdom uh, centered at Alexandria. Uh, he had a son who was Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who built the great library, who sponsored the uh, Septuagint translation. And he said, hey, we hear that you guys have uh, these laws of Moses. We'd like a copy for our library. Can you, can you come and give us an official version for our library? Now, where did Philadelphus get that idea? Well, okay. Go back to 315 BC, when it's still Ptolemy the uh, first uh, There's a there's a, um, a Greek writer. His name was Hecateus of Abdera. He came down to Egypt. He wrote a book all about the Egyptians, uh, their history, their customs, everything. And he said 
that uh, the Egyptians colonized the world. They sent colonies everywhere. They, they colonized Athens. They colonized Babylonia. They colonized uh, the kingdom of Colchis on the Black Sea. And they had these little foundation stories uh, for each one of them. Uh, one of his foundation stories was uh, the, uh, there were too many Egyptians. So they sent out a colony to their uh, little neighbor to the north called Judea. And uh, it was led by this Egyptian. Uh, his name was Moses. And uh, all of this text, it's preserved. It, it exists today. But it's, Greek it's a Greek foundation story. He said, Mo okay, so Moses, he took these, uh, these guys and they went up to Judea, which was totally uninhabited. And Moses, he laid out their constitution, their laws. He built, uh, he founded their capital city of Jerusalem. He founded their temple. He divided up the land. He conquered some of the neighbors. Most of that stuff is not in the Bible. Moses didn't found Jerusalem. He did not build the temple. None of that stuff. Right. Uh, none of it. And and his his fictional account uh, of Moses and uh, colonizing Judea, it reads, I mean, it, it's not, it's kind of like the Bible, except that it's totally different. And a lot of it actually comes from Plato's laws, a lot of the laws that he attributed to, uh, to Moses. And, but it's like these fictional stories about how the Egyptian uh, named uh, Belus, the son of Poseidon, he went up to Babylonia and founded Babylonia from Egypt total fiction. He's just making this stuff up to aggrandize the Egyptians. But it's a story where there's a guy named Moses. He leads a colony from Egypt to Judea, founds their nation, constitution, and laws. Okay, that book, the, uh, the History of Egypt by Hecateus of Abdera, it was written for the Ptolemies. It was used to educate his son, Ptolemy Philadelphus. And Ptolemy Philadelphus has this library that wants to have all the literature of the whole world. And he knows, hey, these Jews, they have these laws by this guy named Moses. Send a delegation to Judea and say, hey, we'd like to know about those laws. Can you bring us a copy? Jews go, Moses, who's he? Oh, well, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll come up there. We'll give you a Mosaic law. You want one? We'll, we'll give you one. So they do, they send a delegation of, uh, in, in the story, it's 70 scholars, but really 70 is how many people were in the Jewish Senate. So it was the Senate sent up a delegation of scholars. They did a lot of research in the library. They came up with laws from Plato and Athens and all sorts of places. Plus they had a few laws of their own from like Hammurabi and stuff. Put them all together turned into the Mosaic Law, turned into, and they produced this book that he wanted. He wanted a book about the Mose, Moses Foundation story. They, they handed it to him on a platter. So yeah, uh, yeah, the, he wanted a translation because he heard about these ancient laws, but those laws had never been written down until he made that request. I must ask what books were included that were written here. Cause I know Daniel wasn't part of the bunch, uh, at least if Daniel's dated later, do you know, was it just the five books or was it uh, <clears throat> with their foundation narrative or w were there prophets included in this writing during that time? Well, um, all that I can determine uh, this, this is pretty accurate is that they, they wrote from Genesis through Joshua, at least, probably also the book of Judges. Uh, Joshua and Judges, they're both full, full on Israelite. Uh, the Jews are not prominently, you know, Jerusalem, whatever. Uh, it's very consistent. But, uh, but Ptolemy Philadelphus, he only wanted the Mosaic laws. So they only translated the first five books into Greek, but they had the next two books. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, and you know that was the start of the collection. But then, uh, <laughs> then they went back to Jerusalem, and they uh, just like Plato said, they researched their whole literature, uh, all their oral traditions, all their written traditions, everything for 
writings in every possible genre, and they put together this national literature that was going to educate their citizens from then on. And uh, work, yeah. But uh, but um, other than other than down to judges, uh, that was all that they produced at Alexandria. This is interesting. Okay. Um, last one from him. And then uh, we'll start, we'll start wrapping things up for an introductory okay. podcast okay. because I don't want to yeah. kill you. Your voice That's, gives out if we keep going. Uh, it does. <laughs> yeah. It's a little scratchy. All right. So he says, <clears throat> as you know, our earliest copies of the Homeric epics are very late and the earliest references to them are from the classical period. Would you date the composition of these epics to the classical period, or is there reason to believe that these books are actually based on much older oral traditions than no longer attributed to a single author named Homer? Now, I feel like that was kind of answered, you know, when we talked about this, because there was previous. You're saying that the foundation narrative, though, the Genesis uh, narrative, not that the laws necessarily, even though there probably were, like you said, created laws, um, that were not there prior. You know, they probably went to the library, started to find things that were, you know, taught by Plato and taught from uh, different laws and books and stuff as they research. But, uh, you know, how do you look at that, for example, what, with that question? Now, are we still talking about Homer? Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah, I would. Yeah, I might, yeah, might as yeah. well. Yeah, sure. Just starting with Homer, uh, the standard view, I think, is pretty correct. That he uh, composed, composed it to be recited. It was oral. They may not have even had an alphabet at the time that Homer wrote these amazing poems because the Greeks get their alphabet from the Phoenicians uh, sometime in the late 700s. And Homer and um, Hesiod, they they wrote around maybe 750 to 700. So they were just when the Greeks were becoming literate in the sense of uh, having written tra uh, tradition. So, um, and was Homer an actual person? I used to, I, I read up a lot of, uh, on that in the past. And um, yeah, I think he was a guy. And uh, some of his, some of the writings attributed to him might be later and you have to, do a critical reading of Homer just like uh, anybody else. But I pretty much buy that he was the first great genius of Greek literature. Okay. Yeah. And I think he, I think in that question, I think it's important to ask because he says uh, that kind of, I think he's trying to also go to the, the idea of the documentary hypothesis with the Bible. Oh, the or oral traditions. Like, right. Like that. How much do you think was possibly prior, I guess, uh, since there may have been stuff that goes back? And what do you think? I mean, you look for Hellenistic uh, fingerprints, I suspect. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if it doesn't have one, you're up for grabs, so to speak, that it could have possibly predated? Yeah, I think that the, the cultic legislation about the uh, sacrificial furniture, the sacrifices themselves, uh, sacrifice to um, get rid of worries about guilt, you know, all the different reasons you might sacrifice something. The, the, the calendar, the holy calendar, uh, uh, all of, a lot of these religious laws were uh, probably in existence, older, but oral. Even among the Greeks, they had, uh, their religious laws were oral um, until they were called the unwritten laws until they wrote them all down around 400 BC. And so then they have these books of unwritten laws, <laughs> which anyway, yeah. So, so I'm sure there was this uh, corpus of uh, unwritten laws or oral laws. I don't know. They could have written some of them down. I don't mind if they did, uh, but there's no evidence that they did. Um, So you have this body of, of, of oral laws that are of a religious nature. And then you have all these civic and political laws uh, that are kind of different in the uh, books of Moses, but they're all published together. Now in the ancient Near East, 
uh, nobody published religious laws or religious anything. It was closely guarded secrets that the priests held because that was their monopoly. So they had a real thing about if they did have any written religious things, they would, would put curses on it against anyone who revealed this to regular people. The Greeks, not so much. They, they would publish religious and civic laws together because it was common uh, ownership by the whole people. So, so here in the books of Moses, they're all published together, just like the Greeks even though the laws themselves might have been older uh, and they might have been, we'll call them Hebrew laws, uh, Jewish laws, uh, that, that are oral traditions of an earlier date. Uh, and yet, and writing them all down though in the way they are in the books of Moses, that's got Hellenistic fingerprints all over it. <laughs> And that's what makes you really different. And that's, uh, that's what I'm interested in reading your material. Um, Russell, I really do appreciate this for real. This was really a good show. We have much to come and a lot of material that I need to read that you've already put out enough for me to chew on for us to do multiple podcasts. What is the name of your first book and your second book? Ha. Okay. The name of my first book is Morosis and Genesis, Manetho and Exodus, Hellenistic Histories, and the Date of the Pentateuch. That's, that's the title. That's a heck of a title. <laughs> yeah. The second one I decided, uh, I'll shorten it. It was just Plato and the Creation of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and then my current one is, that's just ready to go out the door, is Plato's Timaeus and the Biblical Creation Accounts. Um, cosmic monotheism and terrestrial polytheism in the primordial history. So I went back to the long title again. Yeah, you can't help it though. I, I respect <laughs> it because if you don't give them enough, you, they kind of got to, uh, what are you talking about? And then when they like read it, your book. Yeah. yeah, it's like a teaser. <laughs> yeah. It, well, it's also like you covered so much material, I suspect, in the book that you rabbit trailed into a different topic in the book that you kind of got to go, the title's got to reflect a little more for them to understand why I went into this and I went into that. That's really interesting. Um, I, I guess in this close, I must go back to the green book, which is actually yes. all your books are green, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're going to do something different with this one. No, two, two out of six are green. I, I've had articles published in other books so okay okay yeah well, but my latest one's green too okay well the first book the 2006 book yeah um we'll just call it barosis and genesis there you go let's just go with that um and it's manesis right is the other guy maneso maneso these two characters are really the hinge pin, if you will, on what made you think the way you're, you're thinking here in this, if I'm not mistaken, at the start yes. of this. Yes, because they provided the earliest possible date when the books of Moses could have been written. That's, and, which yeah. is practically identical with the latest possible date. I mean, you get a two, two years wiggle room. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm with you in terms of let's be critical, um, but let's be open-minded and continue our research. Because for me, I, when I left Christianity, I went as minimalist as you can on the New Testament to a point where there was no historical Jesus at all. I was fully convinced of that, at least in my head, that this guy's so mythologized. I just couldn't wrap my head around how a guy could still exist and you mythologize him to that level, right? I couldn't understand that. And then now that I've been reading more broader and kind of like just digging in other material, I'm thinking, well, there could have been a guy. Um, I'm not convinced yet who or what, you know, and I'm only speaking New Testament with Jesus at the moment, mm -hmm. but I'm, I mentioned that because that's important in all of this research to me on how I'm going to approach topics. I used to be maximalist. Then I went, absolutely as far as you can minimalist and in terms of saying there may not even have been a guy to let me go back and, and sweep away some of this and see there is some history here 
um, maybe convoluted, maybe twisted, maybe something mm-hmm. there, mythologized, whatever. But I, I, I'm looking for the bones. And you're a man that I'm, I'm interested in interviewing in the future more on this. And obviously recommending people to get the work. They really should. And check out his other podcasts. If that isn't enough, if this is not enough of a hit, you know, uh, for you to itch for more, um, you really should check out the other shows he has on YouTube with uh, Dagger Squad YouTube channel and others. Huh? Really important. I really appreciate you coming on. And if you have anything you'd like to say to the guests before we go, please do. No, it's just been a fun ride. Uh, you seem to have a very intelligent audience and people should think critically. Uh, you know, there are no authorities. Uh, you know, you can't believe... Uh, a minister or uh, or uh, or uh, someone who's on the opposite end just because uh, you think they're great. Really process things and think critically for yourself and you'll arrive at the truth, hopefully. The love it, love it, love it. Russell Gamirkin, thank you so much for joining me today. And everybody, go down in that description. Check him out. He's got a website. It's down in the description, as well as his book, the links to his books. Uh, you guys definitely write me on my email. It's uh, mythvisionpodcast at gmail.com. That'll be down in the description as well. So if you guys have any questions or anything you're interested in, let me know. And thank you so much, Russell, for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Yes, sir. And ladies and gentlemen, we are. Myth Vision.